So welcome to our program. Uh, we have a very special talk today. And before we dive in, um, well, my name is Michelle. I'm NUMU's Education Curator. I extend a warm welcome to all of you. And I'd like to read uh, our land acknowledgement. So as a member of the Los Gatos community, we acknowledge that we are guests on the ancestral and traditional land of the first people of this region the present-day Moakmo Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, historically federally recognized as the Verona Band of Alameda County. We support the restoration and sovereignty of this Chochenyo, Tamyan, Ramaytush, Iwaswa speaking Bureau of Indian Affairs documented Ohlone tribe, as well as all indigenous peoples. So we have a wonderful program with some guest speakers today, inspired by the themes of our exhibition, Terra Firma. This is actually the last week to see Terra Firma in person. So I highly recommend coming, stopping by the museum. We're open Friday through Sunday from 10 to four. And um, the themes in Terra Firma, it's a, it's a group show and the artists use a diversity of media to explore themes of stewardship, social justice, place, identity, migration, um, personal connection to the land. And so with all of this wonderful inspiration, um, we have our wonderful guest curator, Marianne McGrath. And we have lovely guest speakers, Sasha Berlman, Don Hankins, and Val Lopez, who we'll, we will be hearing from tonight. And I'd just like to start by introducing Marianne. So Marianne McGrath is an independent art curator. After many successful years working within museums, including NUMU, curating exhibits and presenting art and education programs, Marianne started an independent practice. Her curatorial projects for art institutions and galleries aim to bring art to the community through thoughtful, diverse, locally connected and globally relevant exhibitions. Marianne's passion for art and art education motivates her to work as a curator in introducing people to art and contributing to the contemporary world. So thank you, Marianne, and I'm going to pass it off to you. Welcome, Val. Thank you. So, yes. Well, um, I'm going to give a um, thank you, um, Michelle, and thank you, Sasha and Val and Dawn. Um, I'm so excited you could join us tonight to talk about these very important um, issues. And I'm just going to do a quick um, inter introduction of. Um, for all of you and then we will um, start with some questions and then move on to questions from the community. So uh, Sasha Berlman, PhD, is director of Fire Forward. Sasha plans and organizes cooperative controlled burns and leads community efforts around fire management. Sasha earned her doctorate in wildfire science from University of California at Berkeley. She is a California state certified burn boss, a prescribed fire training exchange trex coach, and a wildland firefighter, firefighter. Sasha is a board member of American Wildfire Experience, Bay Area Prescribed Fire Council, and Central Coast Prescribed Fire Council. Professor Don Hankins is a professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at California State University Chico and field director for the California State University Chico Ecological Reserves. His areas of expertise are pyrogeography, water so resources, and conservation. Combining his ac academic and cultural knowledge, he is particularly interested in the application of indigenous land stewardship practices. He is internationally recognized for his work on indigenous fire. Chairman Val Lopez, Val Lopez is, has served as chair of the Ama Munson Tribal Band since 2003 and the president of the Ama Munson Land Trust since its inception. Val is a Native American advisor to the University of California Office of the President on issues related to repatriation. He is also a Native American advisor to the National Alliance on Mental Illness 
and the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. So first off, we'd love to hear more about each of you and how each of you got into the work that you're doing today. Let's go in the order that you were introduced. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. OK, um, I think that puts me up first. Um, yeah, I'm Sasha Berlman. It's really a, a joy to be here today and an honor to be on this panel with uh, Val and Don, um, huge role models in this field. Um, I got into this field uh, really because wildfire was a, a big fear of mine as a kid. I grew up in an area that had a lot of them, really uh, major wildfires every summer. and um, I was always an outdoorsy kid, um, and as I grew older, I had an opportunity to do a docent training program at a local nature reserve that was really special to me and learned for the first time in my entire life at age 19 that uh, fire actually has a really beautiful role to play in our landscapes and in our lives. And um, it seemed very wrong that it took that long for me to understand this really meaningful integral part of uh, what it is to be someone who lives in California and uh, the way that uh, we can interact with our landscapes and with fire. Um, and so I, I ended up pursuing this uh, field, hoping I could find some niche to try to make a difference. And uh, I've landed at uh, this incredible institution, uh, Audubon Canyon Ranch, a local nature, non, uh, nature conservation nonprofit based in the North Bay area that has uh, really empowered me to, to take that work forward through this program, Fire Forward. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit of my background. And I definitely say the community of people around here um, inspires me every single day to keep doing this work and getting to partner with folks like Don and Val. Great, thanks, uh, Sasha. Um, yeah, Don Hankins here, and and um, one, I just want to say that it's a real pleasure to be able to speak with you all tonight, and also share the space with Val and Sasha. Um, for myself, the connection to stewarding the land is really kind of goes back through my childhood, and you know, kind of even beyond that. Um, I guess in terms of fire, I I began um, being introduced to fire. Uh, around family, you know, gatherings, um, tending to, you know, burn piles and things like that as we worked on our on our property to to clear up, you know, brush every year, um, brush and branches from from trees that we, you know, glimmed up and things like that. And I learned a lot about fire behavior and 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 taking care of the land uh, in that way. Um as a as a person of uh, wearing multiple hats, I'll, I'll just say, you know, I was introduced more from my academic side, but cult culturally, I'm Muak from the Delta area, and um, uh, those those kinds of responsibilities were kind of just brought into my my upbringing. Um, you know, the the connection to place, um, the the need to take care of the land, and um, and and I would say that really for me the interest really came from the cultural practice. Um, I'm a weaver, um, and you know a lot of our materials that we use for weaving our baskets are um, tended to with fire uh, to make the materials more supple, to make them uh, of better quality, uh, to to be able to to weave different kinds of baskets from fish traps to baby baskets to you know you name the the different kinds of baskets that that we have um, culturally and, and fire plays a big part of that, and so you know, as, as I, um, you know, grew up and became a young adult and was, was off to university and studying conservation biology, one thing that really resonated with me in, in terms of the study of like declining species and biodiversity conservation was that a lot of the species that I was learning about as being in decline were also species that were culturally important to us. And, you know, I think about one in particular, the California condor um, is, is one that I've worked with, but um, is central to our, our, um, our origins and has a relationship to fire. And, you know, if we're not taking care of our lands and we're not taking care of those species and, you know, by taking care of the lands and taking care of those species, and we also take care of the places where we live and we rely on. And so that's really where 
for me that that begins at and as i as i went on and worked uh a, you know an early career in um, agencies working for conservation purposes fire ultimately trickled back into that um, working uh, in the bay area bringing fire to places like uh, russian ridge and and anya nuevo and different places on the peninsula in that work capacity uh, the traditional knowledge side of fire was always there guiding me um, in terms of the, you know, what the applications of fire should be to sustain the species that we were working for and with. Um, and then, you know, ultimately I moved on to a, to a career working at, at the university um, with the intent of teaching people uh, to be better stewards, to have that relationship with the land and I would say, and as I was introduced as a field director for this issue, Chiku Ecological Reserves, I get a great opportunity to provide that um, on a on a hands-on level with our students and with other folks who come out and work and burn with us. And we've got uh, over 8,000 acres of land in the Lassen foothills that we get to do that on. And uh, a tremendous number of people from across the community engage with us, including our local tribal uh, folks from the uh, Machupta tribe and other tribes in this particular region where I'm where I'm joining you from today. So I'll stop there. I know there's going to be lots of questions, but I'll turn it over to Val. Thank you. Um, my name again is Valentin Lopez, and I'm the chair of the Ama Mutsu Tribal Band. And our tribe is comprised of the descendants of the of the indigenous peoples that were taken to missions Samuel Batista and Santa Cruz. Um, so that's our territory. We were very close to you, just the other side of the of the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is behind me. Um, um, <clears throat> our as as a as a child, you know, we 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 did a lot of, of of not a lot, but we did some burning of pile burns, or just burning to clear areas and spaces and stuff like that. But we didn't really tie it to the to the traditional culture of, of our tribe. And um, I was elected chair in two thousand three, and then in two thousand six, um, the elders told us we need to um, re. Uh, we need to get back to our territory to take care of Mother Earth and all living things, and we need to restore the indigenous knowledge that our ancestors had. And um, many of our people were poor and lived in the in the valley, such as myself included. Uh, I live in Sacramento, and we have many members in the Fresno, Hanford, Madera areas. But um, you know, we said hey, we need to get back to our territory, and that was puzzling. We didn't know how we were going to do that. Uh, but we got invited by the superintendent of Pinnacles National Park um, shortly after the elders talked to us. And, um, you know, um, and at, uh, after the elders talked to us and asked us to um, become part of Pinnacles and to have a co, you know, like a co management um, agreement there and to let them know what our priorities were as a tribe and what we would like. And um, after talking about it with council, um, we said that, you know, we lost a lot of knowledge and we were worried about that. But um, the council, they, they said that, you know, what happened to us wasn't our fault, but we have an obligation to get that knowledge back. And so since that time, we've been working very hard to restore that knowledge. And then we got a call from, uh, from um, state parks and from UC Berkeley. They were going to be doing a pretty comprehensive study. Um, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a significant tribal site near uh, just below Pescadero and invited us to become part of it. And, and we said, okay, we saw that as an opportunity to learn that knowledge. And um, one of the things they were studying is the frequency that tribes would burn. And what we learned in the, you know, and so when we started learning about the importance of fire um, to our ancestors, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, there's lightning strikes about once every hundred once every hundred years. But when you look at the evidence of fire, including um, doing um, carbon testing on, on all the part uh, the charcoal particles that were found in in test sites, looking at fire ring scars, and looking at other evidence, it showed that our people were burning every seven, eight to ten years on a regular frequency. And um, again, that could not be accounted for for um, lightning strikes. 
And so from that point to the, you know, from that point on, and that was approximately um, 07, 08, um, our people have, have been working hard to restore the knowledge of the fire, but also we have a native stewardship court now who conduct fires. And I'll stop there, thank you. Marianne, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question that has to do with um, how um, we can connect to the land through the arts um, because exhibitions like terra firma provide an opportunity to uh, kind of open the door to understanding. Um, and I'm curious to ask you, um, what do you think are the most important environmental issues facing our region right now? And maybe do we wanna just keep going in this, this order with Sasha first, and then we'll go from Dawn to Val. Okay. I'm gonna mute myself again. Nice. <laughs> I, I did wanna check in. Um, I just limited myself to how I got into this work. I, I can talk about the program that I run a little bit, which might help give people some context. Is that appropriate? <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'm gonna do that first and I might have to ha have you repeat the question so that I remember what's going on. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm the director of Fire Forward program at Audubon Canyon Ranch and we're a prescribed fire capacity building program. So uh, we are working to reconnect people with uh, land and with fire as, just, as a stewardship tool so that those connections are in place and people feel uh, at home in place and connected with the land um, and connected with fire in a, a different relationship from the one that they uh, may experience through wildfire and, and through the traumas that can occur there. Um, and so we, we provide a lot of trainings and workshops to the general public, and we plan and implement prescribed burns as cooperative burns with uh, anyone who's interested in learning and developing these skill sets. Um, and then we do a lot of public outreach and education as well. And nowadays we have uh, multiple more intensive programs. Uh, we have a fellowship program that works with partnering orgs and agencies to provide training in this career path, essentially, to provide professional development to people working in land management and land stewardship around fire specifically and stewardship of fire on the land. Um, and then we have an apprenticeship program that's full time for one year, uh, working people through all seasons of what it looks like to steward land with fire as a core focus of that and how fire and ecology play with each other throughout the year. Um, and and then we work with the Greater Good Fire Alliance community as well. So um, the Great the Good Fire Alliance here is a prescribed burn association, and those are all over California and all over the US. Um, and those are just cooperatives of anyone who's interested in learning these skill sets um, and, and reconnecting with the land. So we have folks from all different backgrounds in the Good Fire Alliance who come out and volunteer on these prescribed burns. They take vacation days from work to be a part of it. They take, uh, you know, they spend their entire weekends uh, out on the fire line, sweating and getting covered in ash uh, to participate and be a part of this community. So really incredible community of folks who are dedicated to supporting this effort to put good fire back in the, our landscapes. Um, so that's the work I do. Um, and from there, I'll ask you to repeat the question. <laughs> Thanks for giving me that time. And you're muted again. <laughs> Sorry. I should just leave myself unmuted. Um, <laughs> so the question is, what do you think are the most important environmental issues facing our region right now? Uh, <laughs> there are so many, and this is something that really depressed me as a teenager uh, before I found this avenue of reconnecting with the land and with a way of making a difference or trying to. And um, so for me, actually, I would say that that's one of the things is um, the kind of bifurcation of people from land and ecosystems is in and of itself a, a, a huge issue looking forward and, and something that we need to resolve and as a subset and a problem within that would be access to stewardship of land um, for diverse parties like um, land belong land 
in my opinion, should belong to the commons. And uh, if we have people who can't access land and can't access that connection to nature and that connection to stewardship and that sense of place, we're going to continue to have um, communities that that don't feel and see that connection or um, have kind of that, the, it results in some kind of sickness in people, I believe, that um, that won't allow us to heal the the many other problems that we also have um, in our relationship with nature. And so I think that's kind of at the core of it is um, creating meaningful access for people to land. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say, you know, in terms of there's a lot of issues, obviously, that that are affecting um, various areas of our regions. Um, in particular, I think about you know the the San Francisco Bay Area, where, where many of you are probably joining from, and you know, obviously you have things like sea level rise, and you know the effects of the overarching effects of climate, uh, the climate crisis um, that are that are triggered by that. And sea level rise is just one piece of that. Fire is obviously another piece of that. Um, and and really, when I look at the intersection of a lot of these different things, it it comes down to the choices that we we make, um, where we live, how we live how we engage with our environment. And I think if we are going to uh, reverse the, the trends of what we're experiencing and, and start to get more ahead of the curve, then we really need to start engaging more directly with the things that we can engage with. Um, we maybe can't necessarily individually stop sea level rise, but we can be better stewards of the land we live on. We can engage with fire um and and you know other types of stewardship in our own backyards um and by doing that uh you know helping to increase maybe water infiltration into the land and holding water within the land and playing with those cycles of fire within the landscape then we're also then um, mitigating or minimizing the risk of fire itself um, but also providing for the species that depend on those uh, plants, the animals um, that, that are reliant on the fire process in, in its own, if we're using fire as the example. Um, and while not everybody has that connection to fire, I think just beginning with what you can do, working in your own yards, working in places that you can volunteer to go out and help um, and be a supporter of, you know, you may not ever pick up the torch, but um, being supportive of programs like what Sasha is doing and what Val's group is doing and what others are doing, um, trying to facilitate this more on on the landscape scale. Um, these are the solutions, I think, to the problems that we face. And um, I guess that's the optimism that we have, right? We have to we have to do something about it. I'll turn it over to Val. Well, you know, one of the most important problems that we're facing now, as I see it, is the removal, removal of indigenous people from their lands. Mm -hmm. And for them having, you know, um, being able to continue with their stewardship practices and traditions. Um, a lot of the, you know, the problems, for example, the, the fires that we had with the CZU fire, for example, and the other fires that we have in California, um, those fires would have never happened if the indigenous people had been stewarding their lands as they had historically, they would, they would have never happened. Um, the way that our people managed to steward at the rivers. A lot of people look at California Indians as being simple hunters and gatherers. And, um, you know, science is showing, um, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, science has to prove it before it's true. You know, I mean, that's one thing that really drives me kind of nuts is that everything, you know, that all our practices, they don't become true until the scientists say they did. But um, the way we took care of the waters, the way we took care of the fish, the wildlife, the native plants and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, you know, the way our, 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 um, our ancestors took care of them, it provided for a very, you know, the, you know incredibly diverse landscapes. It provided for long uh, sustainability for thousands and thousands of years. It provided for clean water. Um, and a lot of our practices intentionally did that. And, uh, you know, and, and so that's, and that's what we're facing. And that's what we're dealing with now. When we work with the scientists and we work with, you know, with people from Berkeley, UC Berkeley and Stanford and UC Santa Cruz and others, 
I mean, I don't even consider it or call it science, um, um, research anymore. I call it validation. When they work with us, they're validating the way that our ancestors took care of these lands. And if I get the opportunity, I'll talk about a little bit about that later. But um, you know, to me, that the, the big issue is that we got to restore um, traditional indigenous stewardship. We have to teach others, non-natives, to to take care of the lands the same way. You know, I frequently say that there's not enough natives to do the work now. We've been removed. You know, we've been reduced in numbers, and and now we have to um, take responsibility to show to train and show others about that indigenous stewardship so they can take care of Mother Earth properly. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, wow. So after years of drought in California, we've had so much rain lately. Um, so we're curious to know what you all think of how that will affect this year's wildfire season. Um, how does that change or maybe not change the situation? I'm gonna to have to ask for it one more time. I'm terrible with audio questions, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so after all the rain this year, do you think that, how do you think that'll affect wildfire season? Yeah, okay, so this one's really interesting. I'm gonna give my my little soapbox on it and I'm curious if Don and Val would disagree, but um, a, a rhetoric that I've heard a lot of in recent years um, from like, big agencies is, oh, you know, the all the rain's gonna make a really big grass crop and that's gonna drive really big wildfires. And um, I think there, I think that that is, that has its truth and it's, it's kind of a really broad simplification of the dynamics. Um, yes, lots of rain, if it's warm also can result in a big grass crop. And that can mean that in grasslands, you have long flame lengths and hot fires that for a firefighter on the line with an engine trying to attack that, it's exhausting and hot and a lot to deal with. That does not translate to like the mega catastrophic fires uh, that we see that are much more driven by uh, much more diverse fuel types than the grass crop that grows in one year, um, including, uh, you know, forests and chaparral um, and woodlands, all of these other systems. And in all of those, the the weather and rain dynamics are much more complex than than that simple rhetoric of, oh yeah, rain means grass, which means big fire. Um, and so, uh, in that system, we have to think about it entirely differently. Like, did the rain come all at once? And then did we have a lot of significant drying? Is the summer really hot? Was the rain enough to actually make up for many years of drought? Or are we still in a drought in those forests and woodlands? Um, and if the drought is still true, then we could still expect significant fire behavior just like we have been based on all of these droughts. Um, you know, there, there are stories from the last couple of years of logging trucks being able to take more logs because the live trees are so dry that they weigh significantly less than, uh, than they ever historically did. Um, so we're, we're dealing with these kinds of systems that are bigger picture, not just did we get enough rain um, or did we not get enough rain in a single season? Um, so there's a lot to it that we we don't really know or understand yet, in my opinion, um, as we go into each of these summer seasons. But then there's a lot of great forecasting. We are starting to see the drought uh, severity dropping, right, like just like in the last week. So we may be seeing some actual benefit from this rain this season, but there's still a lot to to figure out in the, the coming months, I'd say. Um, I will say like just for people's minds, uh, as an example, a month or two ago, we had all of that rain and then we had about a week of drying and I went out and did a burn. I think I saw Don the day after this and told him about it. Um, we went out and did a burn in uh, Douglas fir fuels about a week after we'd had just downpours of rain and it was 
burning incredibly hot and all the way down to bare mineral soil. Um, so clearly the drought is still there and one big pulse of rain, a lot of that water is just like running off, right? It doesn't have time to absorb into those fuels. So talked a lot, but <laughs> that's my soapbox on this. It's complicated. <laughs> Yeah, I think what Sasha alludes to, you know, in terms of the dynamics between the the grassland fuels in the lower elevation in particular and in the more, you know, forested fuels in the higher elevations, there's there's a um, relationship there, obviously, with the amount of water. We know from a fuels perspective that when we have moisture, uh, the fuels grow. Um, so, yes, there's a, there's more fuel to burn potentially, but uh, ultimately it comes down to ignitions. And, you know, where, what are the sources of ignitions? Last year, we had very dry conditions and, and you know, some, some decent growth of vegetation, particularly in the foothills. And, and it could have been a really big year. I mean, we could have easily gotten to, if we had significant ignitions, you know, uh, millions of acres, just like as we've experienced in years past. But we were fortunate to not have ignitions. And, you know, roughly 95% of, of all fires are started by uh, human, human causes. So, you know, while we may have more fuel this year, or maybe not, depending on where we're at, um, you know, it comes down to where, what are those uh, trigger points? Is it, it, you know, is there going to be uh, infrastructure failure with uh, power lines? Is it, is it somebody dragging a chain or flicking a cigarette or arsonist or whatever? Like those are all um, ways that, that we, you know, get these fires happening. Um, certainly the drought stress is relieved. I, I can say living in the woods myself, you know, I, I, I've, I know over the last three weeks of having rain, snow and more rain that, um, that the groundwater is, is, you know, getting replenished. We, we have good infiltration, not all, not usually with the atmospheric river that's dumping a bunch of rain over a, a, over a short period of time, but the more of the sustained rains that are allowed to soak in. And I think that that's going to help a lot with some of the tree mortality, but we've got a lot of dead vegetation that's out in the woods from past years of severe drought. We've got, uh, you know, massive areas that have experienced uh, beetle kill uh, and, and other pathogens that have, have uh, damaged our forest uh, cover. And, you know, those are, those are potentially um, problem areas going, going forward. Um, the optimistic side of that is that these are places that we could actually come in and treat. If we if we wanted to, we could do prescribed burns. We could do the thinning work in those places and 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 reduce that risk. Um, but I will say that you know from a cultural perspective, like that relationship between fire and water um, is well recognized. We we know that there's a relationship between you know when when it rains and and how fire interacts with that and and the dynamics that are there. And we can use fire to even um, assist with that rain uh, to develop. Um, so there's a lot of interconnections there that I won't dive into the too deeply on, but um, you know the the point is is that we we do have uh, you know some some unique opportunities that are there this this season, and um, it really comes down to what those ignition sources are. Um, my my answer to your question is, is going to be pretty much the same as theirs. I think it comes down to um, what kind of a summer do we have? You know, are we going to have a summer of intense heat? Are we going to have a, a, a season with, with um, um, conditions that provide for many lightning strikes? Um, when, that, when the lightning started those fires in Santa Cruz, um, our, our, our people were out there, our stewards were out there, and everybody was just watching it. We never seen anything like that. And then the next day, you know, we, we hear about the fires. And such, but we had never seen lightning like that in the Santa Cruz Mountains um, for 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 many 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 years. So you know, the, it all, so it's all going to come down to the conditions that we have um, this summer. The intense heat will dry out everything. You know, you know, um, weather that, that that is unstable and stuff causing um, the lightning strikes is another big factor. And then the unknown human factors of the cigarettes and the and the you know, the automobiles and stuff like that. So um, we have to be ready for everything. Well, I have another question for the three of you. Um, when you've been referring to the prescribed burns and, um, and the 
cultural practices. So for people, for those of us who don't really understand it, how, um, how can we heal the landscape through fire? Can you share that with um, our audience? Thanks. I'd kind of like to pass this uh, first and maybe I can fill in at the end if there's anything left, but um, I think it makes more sense to pass this to the other two voices on the panel. Okay. First. Val, do you want to go first or? Whatever you'd like, Don. Why don't you go ahead, Val, and then I'll, I'll follow up. How can fire heal? Is that what, is that basically the question? Yes. Well, we have to recognize that fire is a sacred gift from creator. You know, if we're going to take care of Mother Earth, it almost began with restoring sacredness to these lands. And, um, you know, and fire is an important part of that. And then you use the word um, prescribed burns, and we use the word cultural burns. Uh, there's, there's a real difference there. Because prescribed fire is basically to reduce fuel loads, to reduce the threat of fire, whereas cultural burns are used to enhance landscapes. Um, um, a lot of times, for example, um, um, the, the, the grasslands and stuff like that, the seeds of the grasslands, they have a really hard shell. And so whenever there's a fire that's not um, of intense heat, when you have a fire, you know, it will soften that shell and you get great abundance of, of, germ of, 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 of plants germinating and such like that. And it, and it, it is truly amazing about how much, I mean, how many of the seed plants are coming up. And that's important for, for, for providing foods for the birds, other seed eating animals and ourselves, you know? And then, you know, that second year after a burn, you get these shoots coming up, up out of the ground. And those are the preferred foods for the deer and the other grazing animals. You know, so there's a real cycle of cultural benefits throughout, um, you know, in, in subsequent years. And then you go through and you, and, you, and you do it again. The other thing after a controlled, after a cultural burn, the cultural burn is very low intensity and it doesn't sterilize the ground. It stimulates it in many ways. And um, it just creeps along the ground and, and it doesn't start trees on fire, dug first perhaps, you know, but we have, you know, but but like today we have a lot of people watching for that and such. And, um, you know, and so it doesn't create a, a big threat um, to, to starting those large uh, out of control fires. Um, and I'll just give one more benefit, you know, whenever you burn those high intensity fires, they burn real hot I mean, they're burning the trees. It's releasing a lot of carbon right into the air. So you, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to uh, sequester carbon for, for tens or you know, tens of years, perhaps hundreds of years. You try to sequester carbon, but whenever you burn the tree, all that carbon escapes and goes up um, into the environment. But whenever you have the low intensity burns, you do not create carbon, you create charcoal. And whenever it rains, and then the, and then the rain or the water does reach the ground, and then, it's, and then it'll, it'll run and trickle down to the rivers and streams. But when it's trickling down, it's going over that carbon. And that carbon is actually filtering the, the water. So when it gets to the creeks and streams, um, that water is much cleaner. I mean, at home, um, I filter my water through a, through a Brita filter, and that Brita filter has charcoal in it. So it's the same effect on the lands. So there's a lot of benefits, you know, um, to cultural burning. There's many, many more than what I said. Those are just a few examples. But um, that, 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 you know, that's, that's what I'd like to say for this evening. Thanks, Val. Yeah, the, I mean, the cultural burning and, and prescribed burning are, are definitely different animals. Um, they, they do different things, but in terms of how they can be used to heal the land, um, there's a lot of different benefits. Uh, one thing that, that I really see is necessary in terms of achieving the conservation of biodiversity within the landscapes is, is how to apply fire at the right times to restore uh, native species. You know, I know this is something that, that uh, all three of us on here deal with. Uh, many of the grassland uh, species that we see in, in what we call California annual grassland are mostly all non-native species. So when we think about the right timing um, of, of how to steward, you know, and maybe we're using the cultural knowledge to frame how, 
how uh, certain species respond at certain times of year to fire as indicators. You know, as we start to steward more along those lines and we start to see an increase in our native species and we start to then see what the cycles of those species are, as Val was talking about, you know, uh, different species of animals and, and plants that, that cycle in following the fire. And those indicators we can use then to tell us when is the next time to put fire back into that place, because it's not just a one and done thing. In some ecosystems, it may be, you know, in some of our chaparral ecosystems, based on even cultural objectives, it may, you know, we may light it once in our lifetime, and then it's the next, you know, many generations before it burns again. Um, but in a lot of our, our uh, ecosystems, they require relatively frequent fire, you know, in our, in our, our grassland ecosystems, you know, roughly two to five years is necessary to maintain the native species. In our oak woodlands, it's the same thing. Um, as Val was talking about the carbon, it kind of got me, you know, also thinking of, of the benefits that come from that fire and how we heal the land. You know, we, we've um, obviously in terms of climate resilience, we need to be sequestering carbon and by burning under the right conditions, we can actually create biochar on the landscape that helps uh, to, you know, absorb carbon and, and be a sink for carbon that's that's stable for thousands and thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Um, that carbon, as Val said, is also important for you know purifying the water, but is also important for storing water. So as we include and increase the amount of carbon in our soils uh, from the burning, we actually help with the infiltration processes and the storage of water within our landscape. So kind of making it into a sponge rather than uh, than a shed, if you will. Um, so those are some of the benefits that 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 we can have from uh, from using fire at the right times and under the right conditions, um, uh, you know, either prescribed or cultural burning. Um, cultural burning gets a lot of those benefits, I think, uh, that um, that are very nuanced. Um, and it's not to say that prescribed fire can't, but um, a lot of prescribed fire doesn't necessarily hit on on all the different uh, benefits that cultural fire does. And that probably gives Sasha plenty of things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot. I'm, these are new definitions that I've just been hearing in the last year, but like parsing out cultural and prescribed mm -hmm. fire. And it makes me, it, it sets me in this path of like, well, I definitely, I, I as a non-Indigenous person do not lead cultural burns, but I, maybe I lead stewardship burns <laughs> and I partner with, with tribes, um, to support cultural burning, um, and uh, because I, I'd say like in, in the community that I'm working with here and that I partner with, uh, we're very much uh, doing this work to steward and tend these systems as a whole. And we're we're looking to um, open up space in the understory of these oak woodlands so that we see a robust diversity of understory plants coming back um, and and all of the values that all of those serve to each other and to people um, and to the animals on the landscape. Um, we, we know in California, as Val and Don have just said, um, that people have been here for so many centuries, uh, millennia, uh, tending these systems and and the removal of people from and the and the removal of access to do that has uh, absolutely set things out of whack. <laughs> and uh, we also have started seeing, which is really cool, um, that like when you bring fire back to these systems in that. Uh, stewardship context in that tending stewardship context um, that the repeated treatment of these places the repeated stewardship of these areas becomes easier um, and it, it's building resilience into these systems and and we've seen even right here in the bay area i think we've had three prescribed burns now where we we did a burn and then a wildfire came and it wasn't even able to reburn that area um, and we we see meaningful impact of that work that we're doing. So we we've seen the resilience impact right off the bat. And when you go, come back and you maintain this stewardship ethos of these places over time, um, you're you're maintaining that resilience. You're maintaining that openness. You're maintaining space for all of these different species to thrive and coexist, um, rather than allowing these things to um, kind of degrade. I 
I think about um, redwood forests a lot. I, I love redwoods, I love redwood forests, but so many of them have so few plants in the understory. Maybe you have like one species of fern that's hanging on in there. And then you look at fire history analyses in redwoods in a lot of, or at least in the Marin County area, um, it's like every four to 20 years was a, was a fire in those redwoods for millennia. And I think about what those redwoods might look like if we hadn't logged the crap out of them, first of all, um, and if we actually had fire in them every four to 20 years, right up until today. Um, and I think of how many of the redwood specific understory plants I might be seeing in those understories if they were tended in that way still today. Um, so there, we could talk for hours about all of the different ecosystems and all of the benefits of fire and people tending those systems with fire um, that, that that brings to those systems. But um, just as some short examples, um, it's, it's really an endless impact and beautiful impact that, that people tending systems in California with fire and these landscapes um, really has. I think that's a really good point that you just said, you know, like this, this beautiful impact, you know, and, and, and what you're saying to me, and what I'm hearing is it creates an aesthetic, you know, and I often talk about the landscape aesthetic that fire creates. Um, yeah. And, and that aesthetic, it maybe comes back to, to Marianne's point of, you know, the connections to art to, to these uh, burns, right, and, and the right. act of stewardship. And, you know, I alluded earlier to the fact that I'm a weaver, you know, and, and talked about how the baskets that I weave uh, benefit from fire, you know, but you don't have to be a weaver to, to appreciate the aesthetic as we think about early, um, you know, what do you want to say, early colonizer notes of, of explorations that they did in, in the state, um, you know, the different regions, what did they see, you know, they talked about their experiences of being able to ride you know, six abreast through a forest, um, which today you couldn't barely walk through without getting poked, you know, in the arm or, or eye um, in a single file line, right? So it's a different landscape, you know, and, and when you can imagine what the understory would look like in a redwood forest or an oak woodland or wherever with the beauty of all the diverse plants that are there, you know, in my research that I do in, in relationship to cultural and prescribed burning, I find that in our oak woodlands and our mixed conifer forest, we have, you know, roughly 90, you know, 90 to 100 species um, in, in these plots that I do, um, which is pretty diverse. Um, but, you know, I, how much more diverse would they have been in pre-contact times and, and under that stewardship? So relate that to the other ecosystems and you can imagine how much beauty there would be uh, and, and, you know, the different utility that you could have from the different plants that are there, um, that, that obviously the cultures were using for art. Um, so anyways, I, I digress a little bit there, but just sharing that, that, that point. You know, just to, I know Michelle has a question, but just to follow that up, then how can we support that, you know, individually, you know, I personally, I know most of us wouldn't, feel um i would never start a fire <laughs> but how can we support you and how can we support this work how can we make people um you know how can we live differently with fire and support the choices that we could be making as far as these types of um, programs and activities to um to create that diversity and that health in our ecosystems um, I can certainly keep doing exhibitions and <laughs> open the door to beauty to pe for people, but, you know, as a, as a, you know, just a person living here in California, can, can you guys speak to that? Um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways that, 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 uh, that could be achieved. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, all of our experiences here, um, you know, Val mentioning the, the cost of living issue, you know, um, and, and a lot of the work that we do in stewardship doesn't, it's not necessarily um, high paying work. Um, it's often very low paying work. And yet, it's a very technical skill. It, it encompasses a lot of deep knowledge about about the landscape. 
that isn't um, isn't seen on par with um, other things that our society values, you know, and thinking about this, you know, like your museum being, you know, on the edge of the Silicon Valley, you know, we value the technology, but we don't value the knowledge base that helps to sustain the ecosystems upon which our entire livelihoods uh, in existence as human beings and, and the, the world we live in is is set in balance with, um, you know, so so there's there's that piece um there's there's a lot of legislative kind of things that are that are um happening currently and i know val and and sasha and myself are all involved in different things like that but you know those are just some easy you know kind of low-hanging fruits of where people could engage to support this kind of work for sure yeah um definitely room to you know uh, educate your neighbors hosting panels I, like this. I, I appreciate you doing that. Any any audience that we can reach um, and educate and help understand the role of people and the role of fire and um, in these landscapes is is huge. Um, supporting policy that supports prescribed burning um, and cultural burning and and cultural practitioners in doing burning. Um, there's a lot of policy on all of that going through in recent years and still to come. So supporting all of that is huge. Um, and just directly supporting programs like uh, the program that that Don's working in and the work that Val is doing, the work that we're doing, like directly mm -hmm. supporting all of that work is huge. Um, uh yeah it's, it's so much and if people are burning near you like shout from the rooftops how great that work is and how much you support it and everyone else should <laughs> you know um there you know I, I agree with everything they said you know and we all have our organizations and stuff like that we all do the burning and they all deserve your support so sharing those websites uh, it, it, it is important i'm a mutinlandtrust.org Another thing I wanted to say, though, is that the central coast of California, that was a coastal prairie from Monterey up to just south of San Francisco. That was a coastal prairie, and that was recognized as one of the most biodiverse landscapes in North America. When those early Spanish explorers came by, they wrote in their journals that the landscape was just a beautiful mosaic of different colors and different plants and different trees. And they thought it was just accidental. They didn't realize that that was intentional stewardship by the indigenous people for, for thousands and thousands of years. Now they talk about the, the you know, that we need to restore biodiversity. Well, restoring that, that um, coastal prairie is a, is a very important part of that. And uh, our tribe works on restoring that coastal prairie today. Well, we're almost at 6 p.m. So if anyone from the audience has a question, please drop that in the chat. I do want to maybe give Val you the opportunity to um, share any other ways that all of us here could support the Amamutsin Tribal Band. Um, this is a really unique opportunity to hear from you and that would be lovely to know. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I'm being told I have two minutes for the library. <laughs> um, you know, I'd like to do, yes, you know, our Amamutsu Land Trust, you can go there. But the way we approach fire is we do research before we do the burn. We do research to find out what insects, what birds, what the conditions of the plants are in, the soils, et cetera. And then we do the burn. And then, um, and then we do um, a restoration. We're trying to restore and bring back our native plants. And then following that, uh, we have the, you know, we do the burn, we, you know, we, we, we do additional research and prepare for the next burn. Uh, that's the way we approach it, you know, and, we're, and we have education, you know, we, we ask people to volunteer with our tribe. Um, we have sessions where we have what we call work and learn parties, we call them parties, where people come and they can work with us for three, four hours. And then we have, and then we have, um, uh, you know, uh, learning it, it parts where we'll sit down and we'll talk about the traditional ways of the ancestors and stuff like that. And that's the way to educate the public about that. So, so we encourage you to, to, to find out more about us at the website. Thank you for um, uh, put, putting that there, Michelle, um, you know, to contact us at the, at the website and we'll be happy to uh, welcome you and make you part of our community. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Marianne, any last words? <laughs> yeah, I have one last question um, along with all of this. Um, I know we can check out the websites and all of the organizations you're affiliated with. Um, um, but what could we investigate beyond the public policies and voting measures and keeping our eye out for all of that kinds of thing? Um, how can we individually um, be good stewards of the land right now? Um, you've spoken to a little bit some of the community things, but how can we each individually be better stewards of the land? You're welcome to come out to one of our trainings or burns and, and join us on the ground <laughs> anytime. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really great way. You know, if you're not sure of how to interact with the land around you, find stewards locally who are who, who like Val and Sasha are both offering locally there in the Bay Area to to come and join. You know, if, if you're up in the Chico area, our ecological reserve has a volunteer program and we've got all kinds of different opportunities around fire. Um, it doesn't require, you know, most of the burns that I do on the ecological reserves don't require us to have, uh, you know, any specific training for people to engage on it. So you can come out with, uh, you know, as long as you're you're an able-bodied individual, even even not. I mean, I, I'd take anybody out really, um, just to get give them that opportunity. But um, there's lots of different ways of engaging and and just you know seek seek those opportunities where and how you can. My final words is Mother Earth is sacred. I mean, we need prayer. We also need to develop very intimate, loving relationships with Mother Earth and all its uh, and, and, uh, and all its um, uh, wildlife, et cetera. And I do have to go now. They're kicking me out. <laughs> Thank you, Val. Thank you, Thank you so Val. much. I think right. those are the best words to end on. And this will be available as a recording on our website. So. Um, we'll be able to share it with anyone you might think would want to learn more about this topic. And we have all the affiliated websites linked as well on our website. So check out all of these wonderful organizations. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Don, so much for your time. This was so Absolutely. informative. I've learned Thank so you. much. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'll share one thing that you know Val Val stepped off, but um he 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 and I and, and a group of others have formed recently an organization called the Indigenous Stewardship Network, and we're a statewide uh, entity that's um, that's now there around everything from rain stewardship to fire, and we're mostly fire focused at this point. But, uh, you know, we've got folks within our network who are working with Sasha, we've got obviously Val and, and his group, and, you know, there's just, there's st stuff happening all over the place. And uh, while we don't have a website that I can share with you at this point, um, hopefully soon, you'll you'll learn more about it. Um, but there's just lots of different groups that are doing doing really good work out there. So I'm just sharing that. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. All right.